Welcome to our 1200 mile summer road trip from Manchester to Paris and back. In this video you'll see what it's like to take a family of four on a two week road trip in a long range Tesla Model 3, the good, the bad and the ugly. So we only use Tesla superchargers and free destination chargers so you'll see whether this caused any range anxiety on our trip. I'll also show you some scenarios where Tesla's automatic emergency braking kicked in so you can weigh in as to whether it was correct to do so or not. And we'll also see whether all our family stuff will fit in the boot or not. So onto the route that we'll be driving. Starting from Manchester, we'll head down to Windsor, then across to Dover, over the channel by ferry and straight down the west coast of France to see its fantastic beaches. We'll then drive inland to the Champagne region. And when we get to Paris, I'll share some handy charging tips on taking a Tesla to Centre Parks and Disneyland Paris. We may even catch a glimpse of some famous footballers on the way too. Okay, let's go. So before we set off, here are a few things that you might find useful to ensure that you're setting yourself up for a successful Tesla family road trip. First up, you want to set off in a nice clean car with all the sensors working. So we gave the car a good clean inside and out. I also have these bomb proof mats, which I cleaned up ahead of the trip along with the boot and front liners too. We put the protective mats back in Protected the back seats with a seat protector, as we all know what kids are like on long road trips with snacks in the back. You'll see how much punishment these protective mats took later on in the video. Next job was setting up multi-point redundancy. So I set up my wife's phone as a spare key and gave a spare physical key card to my son. I had also bought a spare SD card in case the supplied Tesla USB drive failed, which would render the dash cam and sentry modes completely useless. Place your bets now as to whether or not I needed the spare SD card and I'll let you know by the end of the video. As there's no spare wheel in the Tesla, I looked into what to do if I got a puncture on this point to point road trip. Having toyed with the idea of a spare space saver wheel, I realized there was no way we'd have enough room left for all our stuff. So I made sure I had a European breakdown cover and kept a few items in the front for quick access should the worst happen. So I brought a few cans of Holtz tire weld, a tire plug kit, an air compressor, Tesla jack pads, high vis jackets, a spare USB card, and the supplied Tesla emergency bag. Also at the time when driving to France, we needed to take a GB sticker and finally an insurance green card. Next onto interior comfort. Having searched for a decent mount or holder so I could mount the kids devices in the back at eye level, I eventually developed my own cheap and cheerful solution, which works surprisingly well. It's simply sticky Velcro that you can buy from Amazon and I've linked it in the description below that leaves no marks when removed and does the job perfectly. Finally, the big question, can we fit all this luggage into the boot of the Tesla? Well, I started putting the items that we'd use less frequently in the hidden compartment in the boot. Obviously getting to these items when you're out on the road is a complete pain. So definitely bear that in mind when you're doing your own packing. I put the two big suitcases on top of the boot liner and then everything else on top and around them. Amazingly, it did all fit first time. It's incredible what you can fit in the boot of a Tesla. And with that, we were rolling and on our way to our first stop, which was Windsor. Despite a little bit of heavy traffic, the journey down to Windsor was very comfortable and we were soon at our first supercharger, which was at Warwick Services Southbound. It was fairly quiet and we were able to get a really good charge rate so it wasn't long before we were back on the road. We arrived in Windsor late on in the afternoon and found a particularly expensive car park at £9 for just 3 hours. Anyway, we had a walk around the sites of the town which are well worth checking out, especially the long walk near Windsor Castle. Back in the car, we set off to find the nearby Heathrow Airport supercharger. Again, these were very quiet, so we were able to get a decent rate of charge and the kids enjoyed watching the planes coming into land overhead. So late in the day, aided by a bit of Rainbow Road autopilot, we headed to our first overnight stop at Cobham Services on the M25. The next day, we set off for Dover. There was a bit of traffic on the way, but we still made good time to make our lunchtime crossing with DFDS. We drove onto the ferry and we were soon on our way. However, whilst we were upstairs enjoying the views and the sunshine, the Tesla was downstairs making a hell of a lot of noise. I hadn't realized it at the time, but Teslas have an anti-tilt security feature and this caused the alarm to go off repeatedly. Lesson learned for the way back, always disable anti-tilt when taking a car ferry. 
Soon enough, we were driving on the right hand side of the road in France and we were heading for a supercharger on the outskirts of Calais. It was fairly quiet so we were able to get a great charge rate and there was a field opposite where we could stretch our legs and have a good run around. The kids even found a little field mouse at the top of this hill. Next up was the scenic coastal viewpoint just 20 minutes west of Calais. The colours in the sea were fantastic and the coastline we were heading towards looked very alluring. However, it was at this point that our first Tesla automatic emergency braking incident occurred. Let me know what you think in the comments below. We're driving along here on a, a fairly narrow road and it seemed like the people walking towards us didn't really care that a car was coming towards them. And as we pulled alongside them, bam, the Tesla jammed on the brakes. Even though we were only going five miles an hour at the time, it was a serious jolt to us inside the car. My view is that they should have moved to the side earlier, but the Tesla braked too late to have any meaningful effect anyway. So after explaining to my family what just happened, we started to make our way down to the next town. The scenery was stunning, the sun was shining and we were looking forward to hitting the beach. However, driving through this narrow street just 20 minutes after the first incident, Tesla's AEB kicked in again as this French chap opened his door just as we were getting close to him. My opinion on this one is that with the door open, it was too narrow for us to get through comfortably, but I think the Tesla saw the person and panicked a bit. Let me know what you think. The wife demanded that I turned AEB off immediately, but I managed to negotiate a free strike rule and the great news is that it's never happened again since, so a year into owning the car, it's still enabled. We carried on down the coastline taking in some beautiful beaches and sand dunes and then we arrived at Fort d'Ambel Juice. This picturesque fortress juts out from a sandy beach and is surrounded by a beautifully coloured sea. This boat looks so good carving through the glistening turquoise sea looks like total freedom soon enough we carried on down the coastline to our final destination for the day Wimero. this quiet coastal town is well worth a visit it has a huge beach overlooked by some fantastic hotels and restaurants and we were very lucky to grab a table at a seaside restaurant that night and enjoy a great sunset before returning to our hotel which by the way had an unexpected surprise behind this door simply a toilet in a cupboard very french the next day we carried on down the coast we still had great battery levels despite not charging since the calais supercharger with a field mouse god bless the long range battery we made our way to a vast beach that was very windy but it gave us some excellent roberto carlos curling free kicks on the beach we then carried on to a campsite with a pool where we'd be staying overnight Given this was the first time the kids had been in a pool since the pandemic started 18 months earlier, we all went nuts for it, hitting the slides and having fun. We also managed to get a lakeside cabin with a terrace which was great to have a beer on at night. I guess I could have hooked up the granny charger out of a window of the cabin, but I knew we were going to go to a decent supercharger the next morning so I didn't worry about it. The next morning, after a walk around the Bay of Somme Nature Reserve, we headed to the Air de la Baie de Somme Supercharger, which is just off the A16. The chargers were easy to find and again were quiet, resulting in another rapid charging session. The services here were great too. It had all the essentials, it wasn't too pricey, and even looked out over some water at the back too. So, juiced up to 97%, we carried on our journey inland along the A16 and A26 to a small city called Rams, just to the east of Paris. It's a nice city to visit with a decent cathedral, but that wasn't the main attraction for us. We'd actually managed to get tickets to go and see Rome versus Paris Saint-Germain that night. And when we were walking through the city centre, we saw a crowd of people waiting outside a hotel. It could only mean one thing. The PSG team were staying there and they were about to get on the team bus. We joined the crowd and waited patiently to catch a glimpse of the star attraction. There he is! Lionel Messi had just signed for PSG a few weeks earlier and rumour had it that he'd be making his debut that night in the small 20,000 seater stadium. I took my footy mad son to the match and we got to see Messi, Neymar and Mbappe up close. It was an unforgettable night. The next morning before heading into the Champagne region we went to a local supercharger in Roms. Again it was very quiet, not many other cars charging which meant we got another super fast charge. 
With that, we made our way through the National Park along the D951 to the biggest town in the area, Epinay. This town is well worth a visit if you or your partner like your champagne. There's a giant static hot air balloon that you can take a ride in to get an aerial view of the city and the surrounding vineyards, but only if you're feeling brave. There's lots of stunning buildings around town and you'll also spot many famous champagne houses. At Moe in Shandon, I couldn't help but notice this beautiful red Model S parked outside. After a brief look round, we left Epinay and started heading towards Paris. This stretch of road is in a beautiful area of France and well worth checking out. And on our way to Paris, we ticked over the 1000 km mark for the trip. After a few hours of enjoyable cruise control and autopilot, we were soon leaving the motorway to our accommodation for the next five nights. Villages Nature, which is a French centre park close to Paris. This is by far the most picturesque centre park I've ever stayed at. It's got this modern aqua lagoon as its centrepiece next to the lake. It's full of slides and it's great fun for kids and grown-ups alike. It's actually a partner hotel of Disneyland Paris, which is only a five minute drive from there. So it's well worth considering staying there if you're going to Disneyland too. We were staying in one of the cabins near the lake. And as you can see, there was plenty to keep everybody occupied on site. Once you've unloaded your car outside your cabin, you might be interested to know that you even have a place on site to charge your Tesla. They're only granny chargers that are mainly used to charge their electric buggies. However, you're free to use them, and if you need them, they're in the car park just near the park Marquette. When I got there, another Tesla was already charging up, but there was a charge point available next to it. Excitedly, I got out my granny charger and my travel adapter, but lo and behold, there was no way this was going to work due to the dimensions of the travel adapter plus the weight of the charger. I rushed back to the cabin and picked up my other slimmer travel adapter and plugged it all in. Returning back to the inside of the car, imagine my disappointment when I saw the charge rate was just 2 kilowatts per hour. Still, at least it was free and I was able to leave it there overnight so I can't really complain. The next day, we headed straight to Disneyland Paris which is a short 5 minute drive away. Whilst the parking there is clearly a ripoff at 30 euros for the day, you can at least use their electric chargers if you get there early enough. At the time of filming, there were only four 7 kilowatt chargers, although I'm sure they will add more in the coming years. The chargers are based in the Winnie car park. You get the entrance code from the staff at the main entrance. And to get to this car park, you want to hug the outer perimeter road, follow it all the way around, past the caravan parking, and then turn left, enter the code, head to the far left hand corner of the car park and you'll find the chargers there. Car plugged in and charging up, it felt good to head into the park for the day knowing that at least I'll be getting some change from the extortionate parking fee. I checked on the cars charging a few times during the day and when we returned to the car at 8.30pm it was fully charged. So after five days of Disney and Centre Parks it was time to head home and we set off from Paris aiming to catch the 2pm ferry back to Blighty. This time we will be taking a more direct route back whilst retracing our steps through familiar superchargers. As we were starting the long journey back we checked the odometer and so we'd done 676 miles at this point. We spent most of the morning on the A roads which were quiet and it was easy to have the car in autopilot the majority of the time. It makes a huge difference on these long trips to have the car gently turning for you and maintaining the correct speed and distance from the car in front. And to prepare us for the weather back in the UK, it rained cats and dogs for a decent part of this journey. And halfway through the journey, the USB drive also decided to fail and would not come back to life. As such, having the reserve SD card and reader was a worthy investment. After a quick replacement and format, we were back up and running again. The rain moved on and we were soon enjoying blue skies again as we drove towards our familiar Air de la Beda Somme supercharger. As per usual, it was pretty quiet and once again we got a great rate of charge and we were soon back on the road to Calais. It was at this point that I thought I'd hatched a cunning time saving plan. Our ferry wasn't until 2pm and it was only midday, so I figured why not go for a quick supercharger, our field mouse supercharger. Then we just roll down the hill, get on the ferry and avoid needing to charge quite so soon when we get back in the UK. Now, just for context, when we got the ferry over from Dover to Calais, it took us about 20 minutes from driving into the port to being at the front of the queue for the ferry. 
I'd assumed it would be something similar the other way around, worst case maybe twice as long. Oh, how wrong I was. We got to the car for report just after 12.30pm and there was just a fairly small queue to get through customs. What I hadn't anticipated was that many people hadn't filled in their COVID passenger locator forms and other required documents ahead of time. Add to that there weren't many border control staff working and we had a tense wait on our hands. 12.30 soon turned to 1.20 and there was still another checkpoint to get through after this one. Frustratingly, even though we got through that second checkpoint at 1.50, they didn't let us on the two o'clock ferry. Instead, we had to while away a couple of hours dockside and get on the four o'clock ferry instead. Thank goodness for the in-car Tesla entertainment. Another lesson learned, don't try to be too smart where ferries and charges are concerned. Soon enough, we saw the white cliffs of Dover and made our way across to the Tesla supercharger at Maidstone. The supercharger was busier than we'd become accustomed to, charge rate was slower, but it was fine. We then went to stretch our legs in the forest around Box Hill which has some stunning views before finally retreating to our overnight stay at Cobham Services. The next day we were heading back up north and before we knew it we ticked over the 1000 mile mark. We decided to stop off for a final supercharge of the trip at Warwick Services. It wasn't too busy and we got a decent rate of charge and we were soon back on the road. Just as we were getting home, the odometer ticked over the 1200 mile mark and with that, we were home. That afternoon, I surveyed the damage inflicted by our family of four over a two week period. Pretty vile in the back, as expected. Sand from various beaches in the front. So I managed to recruit a small team of cleaners to help me restore the car back to its pristine state. The protective mats really did a great job in shielding the carpets from taking a beating. I simply removed them and washed them down, put them back in and they were soon looking as good as new. So just before I give my final thoughts, if you're still with me and if you've enjoyed this video, please leave a comment below and drop a like on the video, it will really help me out. And without further ado, here are my final thoughts. It was a fantastic road trip in such an amazing car. It was super comfortable, even on the long days, and having the in-car entertainment was great when we missed the ferry back. I had no range anxiety on this trip, although I was glad that I went for the long range model. It just gives you that extra buffer and means fewer mandatory stops for charging. Whilst we did have those unexpected automatic emergency braking incidents and a failed USB drive, the rest of the trip was flawless. I was very happy that I didn't get any flat tyres and my Holtz tyre weld and tyre plug kit remain unused till this day in the front. So let's talk charging costs. When I got the car back in 2021 I used a referral code, you know when referral codes were a thing, and I got a thousand free supercharger miles. Therefore this whole trip cost me just £1.85 as my free miles ran out part way through the final charge of the trip at Warwick Services. If you're still here at the end of this mammoth video, then thank you for sticking with it. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you're on the fence about buying a Tesla, I can wholeheartedly recommend getting one. Just do it. So I've linked the sticky Velcro, floor mats, other products mentioned in the description below in case you want to pick them up yourself. Finally, if you own a limited company in the UK, you might be interested in some of my other videos on this channel. I have one comparing buying versus leasing versus PCP as a limited company and a whole series on my lease to invest test experiment where instead of buying my Tesla outright I decided to embark on a three year experiment where I lease my Tesla Model 3 and invest what I should have paid for the car into Tesla shares instead. So on June 8th 2021 I bought $72,000 worth of Tesla shares which is the equivalent of the £51,000 I would have paid in the UK and I got that at $602 per share. I'm hoping that this approach ends up paying for my entire three year lease. I only need the share price to get to $850 or higher for that to be the case. And I upload a video every quarter that charts my progress on this journey. Thanks again for watching and don't forget to hit that like button and share this video with others who might enjoy it. Hopefully I'll see you on the next big trip. Cheers for now.